All right, well, thanks. Um, so what I'd like to, so it's been interesting watching um, streaming and linear and sublinear and these things evolve over the years because I guess this was developed in maybe the 90s or so for a use case having to do with you know, probably communication protocols or something. And so you're in a networking environment and the data is going by. And the question was, what could you compute? You know, could you compute estimates of means or medians or things to get sort of rough estimates of what was going on um, in little O of something, you know, without even looking at the data? So um, a lot of the work in randomized linear algebra uh, grew out of, of theoretical computer science. Um, originally, it wasn't particularly useful, but under the hood, there was some ideas that if you change the way you ask questions and, and got slightly different results, they could be very useful, and, and, and they have been. So um, on the theoretical side, for example, the best algorithm for, in worst case theory for very over-constrained regressions is something in this area. And it beats the algorithm from 01 by um, Gauss, 1801 by Gauss. <laughs> and so this was developed in 2005-06 time frame. And you know, that, that's a nice result. And you say, how could that possibly be useful, right, if you go back and beat something that's 200 years old? And so one, a different question you could ask is, you know, could you take this idea and could you, um, say, try and get a good implementation? You can get, certainly get a bad implementation. Could you get a good implementation? So the, the thing to compare to is LA pack. And um, the question Blend and Pick asked, and, and LSR and other things subsequent to that is, um, can, can you beat blend and pick, say, direct dense least square salt? And this has been something that's been engineered to death over the last 30 years. And the short answer is yes. You know, you, you take the theory, you need to use it in a slightly different way, use it as a preconditioner and some smart algorithm engineering and so on and so forth, and, and you can do that. So, you know, it's not the case there that um, the ideas are sort of immediately applicable, um, but sort of indirectly they were. And so I don't know quite what to say about sort of streaming and lower bounds and uh, linear and sublinear aspects, because it seems to me, at least so far, the sort of mental model that, that you have in the streaming algorithm, streaming literature, is not nearly as sort of a useful qualitative guide to practice when it comes to sort of matrix computations or, or vector space type computations. And so there's a couple of reasons for this. One, it's actually pretty hard to get large enough. I mean, we're doing, um, you know, uh, low rank approximations on tens of terabytes. We'll have it on hundreds of terabytes, meaning a quarter petabyte, you know, on time scale, six months or something. So it's hard to get large enough that you really need to you know, to, this, is, this is a pain point. Um, the other thing is just little details about the way you parameterize algorithms actually makes a big difference. And um, when you're a numerical analyst or scientific computer, you ask certain types of questions. So that, that's one sort of use case outside theory. If you're a machine learner or a data analyst, you'll ask different types of questions. So there's an easy way to make the problem um, tractable, and it's put sufficiently strong assumptions on the input. So outside of algorithms, you know, we'll say we want worst case, in, worst case bounds for this input. A very common thing in applied math is to provide sort of sufficient conditions. And say under these sufficient conditions, um, then we get good results. And so oftentimes there's a similar structure under the hood that you need to wrestle with. So in worst case algorithms, you need to, to get good bounds for a wide range of linear algebra problems, you need to deal with something called leverage scores or coherence. This has to do with a notion of eigenvector localization. Short stories, if you get that, you're done. Random projections rotate you to a random basis. So Johnson Lindenstrass, if you're in a vector space, it rotates you to a random basis. You get that, you know, done. Or you, you can say, but, but all the effort's there. You need to find them. You need to do a projection efficiently to, to rotate to this random basis to get them, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can say, I'm going to parameterize a problem and just assume coherence is uniform. And in that case, just sample uniform. I mean, do anything you want and it'll work. So the, the, the basic structure you have to wrestle with um, is similar, but you you'd address it in two sort of very different ways. And so I think it's actually a, a challenge to come up with a good model where um, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and make these extremely strong assumptions, but you get sort of non-trivial results. So I don't want to claim that we have this here, but um, you know, it's, it's sort of a step in the right direction, I think. And the particular context here had to do with the following. So, um, so randomized linear algebra, I told you about the theory, good implementations in, in a range of senses, useful for a wide range of applications. Um, stochastic gradient descent is, is sort of a very different type of method, and I'll, I'll describe what it is. It's something that also, in the same way as the randomized linear algebra, a lot of sort of uh, traditional deterministic people really didn't like, and it took a while for them to get uh, used to it. Stochastic gradient descent is a very different sort of algorithmic approach. A lot of continuous optimization people really didn't like it. The convergence rates are in general worse, and so on and so forth. But it has certain aspects that are very nice for a lot of large-scale data problems, and so it's very popular in machine learning these days. 
And so something that had been in the back of my mind for a while was, you know, are these two things incomparable? Can you combine the two or whatever? And um, we got some results. And we, I think, posted v V1 of the archive. And we issued to some people and some machine learners said, oh, yeah, we get such and such bounds, and we're clearly better. And when you scrape below the surface, you know, they were clearly better because they had made some assumptions about the input. Not, not unreasonable assumptions, but, but assumptions about the input. And so then we iterated a little bit and, and got slightly finer results. And so, I mean, the question, I think, has to do with if you want to be sublinear here, you can make very strong assumptions, or you can try and, and do something in, intermediate and uh, make more moderate assumptions. And so the context here is um, we want to look at sort of linear and sublinear and maybe superlinear aspects of linear <laughs> algebra <laughs> algorithms. <laughs> um, and maybe I'll throw in nonlinear algebra just to sort of cover all the bases. Um, in, in particular, the way these things are oftentimes used is as a preconditioner. You can take it something, solve the subproblem, which is the way we often parameterize it in theory of algorithms. But in practice, it oftentimes uses as a preconditioner of some sort. You, know, you precondition it as a numerical analyst, or you use it for some other preconditioning for some clustering problem. So preconditioning in a broad sense of words. So we're going to want to precondition stochastic gradient descent with um, randomized linear algebra. So background. Um, so stochastic gradient descent. Um, Iteratively solve the subproblem by approximating the true gradient by the gradient at a single example. So you have a general convex optimization problem. If it's convex, go downhill. You'll find the minimum. How far to go, number of steps, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's what you worry about in convex optimization. You want the convergence rate to be pretty good, but you know you go downhill. So in general, and not a very good idea is to choose one data point and use that to randomly estimate the direction because there's going to be a lot of noise and so on. Um, now, it does have advantages that, you know, if you're in a large syst system sort of environment, you can get you know, one example, a small number of examples, and use it as a noisy, um, a, sort of a noisy gradient estimate. So it has a lot of good sort of systems reason why you'd want to do it. And under certain assumptions, it is a good, it, it is a good solution. And those, one of those assumptions is that if the loss function has a certain separability property. You have a million data points. It's a sum of a million things of some loss. If you have other more complicated connectivity and, and dependency structures, it might not be. But if it's separable in that way. So iteratively solve the subproblem by approximating the uh, gradient by the gradient at a random sample. So very widely used in practice because the scalability efficiency, very easy to implement, works very generally. You know, you, you need to get the estimate of the gradient right, but it works very generally. Usually provides asymptotic bounds, meaning it's the, the form of the theorem is not something you'd recognize in, in theory of algorithms. It's not, if I run for this many steps, I'm this close. It's more like I run for some unspecified length of time, and then as I approach the minimum, I converge at such and such rate. And the reason they're interested in rates is you can't compute square root of 2 on a computer. Right? And so they're interested in, in, in the uh, error epsilon as a function of, of how close you are, typically in an iterative algorithm. Um, and it's typically formulated in terms of you know, any problem you know, here, if, if you're, well, not any, but, but a wide range of problems is going to be hard in, in one or another senses of the words. End of the fifth is hard here. So don't think of this as sort of an SDP being tractable here. So it's typically formulated in terms of some sort of smoothness assumptions, meaning you know, if my loss function is separable and my regularizers have some sort of smoothness, then I get such and such results. So it's, there's not an algorithmic claim in terms of this, it takes this long. There's a convergence rate claim, and there's usually some sort of smoothness assumptions. So randomized linear algebra. Construct with either sampling or projections a random sketch, and use that sketch either to solve the subproblem or to construct a preconditioner for the original problem. If I have a sketch that's good, it's plausible I can use it as a preconditioner to get something that's better. So either stop here and get a good low precision sketch or iterate to get a good high precision sketch. So the best worst case theoretical guarantees for certain problems, better control over solutions, less flexible. It's linear algebra. It's not general convex optimization. Um, if you have constraints, you could, these are typically formulated as construct the sketch, solve the subproblem. How do you solve the subproblem? Yeah, I don't know. It's with a LA pack, presumably, some black box. If I have constraints, solve the subproblem with a constrained solver. I mean, do whatever down here. Could you solve this with a, say, SGD algorithm? Um, so typically formulated in um, either TCS style worst case analysis, or let's call it a numerical linear algebra style, where I'm, I want to make claims about the data in front of me. Maybe I want backward instead of forward error stability. But it's about it, the, the data sitting in front of me. It's not about data I might see tomorrow, which is the way st statisticians and, and machine learners formulate the problem. And so, um, 
So that's sort of the one slide summary. So we want to ask, can we get the both, best of both worlds? Can we somehow you know, see how to combine these two? Because they do seem to have some, sort of complementary strengths and weaknesses. So to do this, it's a bad idea to work with sort of vanilla least squares or low rank because either randomized linear algebra or LA pack or something that's been very well sort of designed for linear algebra per se is clearly going to do better than something like SGD, right? Because you're in the domain of one. You clearly shouldn't work for some general convex optimization problem because linear algebra is about linear algebra, not about convex optimization, right? So you want to find some sort of sweet spot where maybe both methods have something to say and you haven't clearly biased the deck in, in favor of one method or the other. So what I'm talking about will hold more generally, but let's talk about it in terms of something called uh, LP regression. So this is linear regression, but not necessarily with the least squares loss function. So it's a more general convex optimization problem, but not fully general. So I have a matrix A. Let's say it's tall. Uh, I think I changed letters on you later, but for now let's say it's n by d where n is large and a vector b, and a number p, then um, in general there's not going to be a vector x such that a times x equals b, because b could have a p sitting outside the column space. So uh, I want to get the best such vector x, where best is minimize the loss, where I sum up over all the constraints, all the rows, the p-norm of the residual. So p is 1 or 2 or 3 or infinity. So it's 1 or 2 or infinity, think. So p equals 2 is at least squares. You solve with QR or something like that. Um, you can get ND squared with direct methods. You can get iterative methods, number of non-zeros times something having to do the condition number. Least absolute deviations. You have P equals 1. This is, you can solve it. You can write it as a linear program. That's not the best way to solve it. There's other solvers. So solve with a black box. Again, don't specify it if you're, if you're an algorithms person. But if you're going to implement it clearly, you have to specify it. So, so this is the problem I'm going to talk about. And Something to think about here, especially with the linear versus sublinear question, is where's their randomness here? So this is a deterministic problem. So randomized linear algebra and stochastic gradient methods have randomness or stochasticness in them. Right? So there's randomness inside the algorithm in both of those cases. The data is fixed and deterministic. Right? If you're a computer scientist, the, there's no noise in the data. It's just what it is. Um, if you're a machine learner or a scientist or anyone else, there's noise in the data and there's no randomness in the algorithm because it's a black box and it's probably deterministic. So what we've seen in a lot of cases is that, and it's, it's, it's come to be sort of well known in SGD, and it's also the case in RLA, that the randomness inside the algorithm um, has computational benefits. It can speed things up in sort of worst case. But it also sort of has statistical benefits or side benefits because it sort of synergizes well in, in, some, in some implicit regularization sense with maybe noise properties in the data. So the idea is if I exactly solve the data sitting in front of me, I'm going to be less robust to data I might see tomorrow than if I only epsilon approximate it. Now clearly if epsilon's machine precision, this isn't quite the case, although there's connections with sort of numerical robustness. But if epsilon is 0.1 or say a half or one, so I get a low quality approximation, I might be better for the data I see tomorrow than if I solve this exactly today. And I can do that with randomness inside the algorithm, which is what these things do. So, you know, how does that enter? So it wasn't clear how to combine the randomized linear algebra or stochastic gradient descent methods here. And to do that, we had to sort of take, I think, in retrospect, it's sort of trivial, but like most, you know, quantum mechanics is, well, maybe not quantum, but almost anything else is in, in retrospect, so sort of trivial once you understand it. So we, we had to take a perspective on stochastic optimization that in retrospect was sort of trivial, but actually took, took a while to figure out. Once we had it, we were able to put both of these under the same umbrella. And I think it's maybe a little bit more general. So stochastic optimization is I have a deterministic problem, and I, so I have a stochastic problem, and I want to solve it somehow. So we have a deterministic problem, and we have two types of stochastic algorithms. So let's let u be a basis for the range space of A. Um, these, this is a linear regression, and so if u is a basis for the range space of A, I can work with A or u. Algorithmically, they're different, right? So think of A as A and u as a q from qr, less singular vectors. But, but at least at a, hand, at a theoretical level, I can, I can replace one with the other. So um, the constrained overdetermined deterministic LP regression problem, deterministic problem, is equivalent to a stochastic optimization problem. Namely, you know, this deterministic problem, min of the p norm of the residual, um, is equivalent to this problem. Minimize over y in that same constraint set the expectation over a random variable drawn from some distribution of some function. And this function h is, you know, ax minus b. It's, it's uy minus b divided by the probabilities. All right? 
Now, this is almost immediate, but um, this is sort of going to be the connection for us to tie these two together and, and under sort of a common umbrella and get a, a method that takes advantage of both. Um, so this holds for any set of probabilities. Now the question is, do I get a good variance? Um, and so that's what we want to talk about. So here's sort of the one slide summary of stochastic optimization. The standard stochastic optimization problem is of that form. Minimize a function, which is equal to the expectation over random variable drawn from some distribution of some f, capital F. Where it's c is a random data point drawn with some distribution. So at a high level, there's two sort of general approaches for solving these stochastic optimization problems. And um, just to keep things confusing, one is SA and one is SAA. So let's call it. So stochastic approximation and sampling average approximation. Wait, so how is the distribution p chosen? It's, like, you choose it. But, but the problem on the left uh, side of the equality was like some... Put a for all p or, you know, somewhere. Okay, so, 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 so for any... For, p, the, right? the expectation doesn't depend on p. Oh. The variance might depend on p. Oh. And we're going to use intelligent probabilities at, at the right spot to tie okay. things together. But yeah. So stochastic optimization says start with an initial weight and, and solve this thing iteratively. At each, at each iteration, you get a new sample point from the distribution. So you know, how you choose it depends on the distribution. And the current weight is updated by its information, which is the gradient or subgradient of f. And you go downhill. So very iterative. You look at a sample average approximation is sample endpoints from the distribution and solve what I'll call the empirical risk minimization problem, meaning you know, I have a particular sample in front of me and solve empirical risk is, is a more general term, but in this context, solve the subproblem on that particular problem. If, if you were to do other things, it might be structural risk minimization, you have regularization, but by empirical risk minimization, I mean take n data points, solve the subproblem on that problem. And, and, so, and so there's a bunch of questions here. Um, so this is a, sort of a general approach, a bunch of questions here. To solve the stochastic optimization problem in general, and certain different fields make different default assumptions, and, and, and one or the other is just obvious. You know, one, one or the other uh, answers to these questions is obvious depending on the particular field. So how to sample, SA or SAA? I mean, not obvious in general, right? But, but certain areas, one's much more natural than the other. Which probably is distribution to use? Do you need to find a smart one, or do you just with, work with a trivial one? And one might be more or less appropriate depending on the assumption you make. Which solver to use? You know, how do you solve the subproblem, or how do you update the weights? So these are sort of the design decision questions. So roughly, it'll, it'll turn out that stochastic approximation, it may sound that, like it's sort of similar, and, and it, you, know, you, can, you can tie things together. And, um, in this context, we'll boil down to a very natural SGD type algorithm on the L1 regression problem. And the SAA problem will boil down to a very natural randomized linear algebra algorithm, get the, get the sample and solve the subproblem. And then we'll be able to tie those two together. So. Um, Here's a picture. Um, deterministic problem related with a stochastic problem. Um, the usual thing would be to solve SA with naive sampling probabilities, so uniform uh, P, and you use some sort of fast gradient descent, and that's vanilla SGD. And if you go to machine learning venues in the last 10 years, there's a million variants of this. Um, a, a different approach could be do something batch. By batch, I mean you know, you do a projection or you touch, you, you do a leverage score approximation, you do something that touches the whole data in sort of a batch sense and then get a subsample. Do some sort of batch computation. Um, use randomized linear algebra with the non-uniform probabilities or uniformly after you've done a random projection to a randomly rotated space. Um, and then exactly solve the subproblem with black box. And that's vanilla RLA. So what we have here is a method that will, you know, allow you to tie the two together. You can do SA at the first step. You can use non-uniform P in a well-conditioned basis. And when I say non-uniform probabilities, think the sort of probabilities you'd use in randomized linear algebra with leverage scores or something like this. A well-conditioned basis is exactly what's used in randomized linear algebra. But the iterative step here is, is what's done in SGD. And then you solve this with a fast gradient descent. And the idea is if you have a good basis, the randomized linear algebra is going to be able to give a low precision solution. But after T steps, there's a batch phase. You get nothing until you've done the batch computation. But after that batch phase, you've got something. And then the SGD will allow you to make some claims about the asymptotic convergence rate. So um, the win is in tying those two together in just the right way. 
So SA plus naive P and U get the vanilla SGD. SA plus naive P, you get uniform sampling, randomized linear algebra, which in general gives you low quality solutions. But if you make strong assumptions about the input, you can, you can get sublinear algorithms there. Uh, SAA with a smart P gives you randomized linear algebra with the usual algorithmic leveraging with random projections. Um, there's connections here with randomized Katzmark's methods, if you're familiar with that, in particular for the unconstrained L2 regression, and that boils down to SA plus a smart P plus a naive U. So there's a bunch of knobs here, and you get something marginally better in, in, than randomized Katzmark in, in, in one region of parameter space. But you basically reproduce the randomized Katzmark's if you're familiar with that. Sure, what's A bar? A bar is A. Um, we change notation on you. A, a, a bar, and I think I was consistent except just on this slide, is A augmented by the right-hand side ve vector B. but we undid that, so I think there's not too many places where that appears, but um, yeah. So if you pick P in a smart way according to leverage words, is that the minimizer for the variance in the right hand side expression or what? If you do the vanilla RLA approach, not vanilla, but the leveraging RLA approach, it's the minimizer for something that appears in the analysis. It's not the minimizer of the thing at the, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect the same thing is here in this combination. Yeah, it's not going to be a minimizer for the downstream variance, it'll be a minimizer for, for It'll be, it'll be the minimizer for the same thing that it is in RLA, which is something that is sufficient to guarantee that you get the result after that batch step that you need. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's actually sort of a subtlety. I mean, it's not clear how you'd minimize this, this thing that you're asking for, because you, if, if, you, if you're going to ask for a worst case bound, you need that batch computation. You've got to touch everything, because any one data, the very last data point you see you could totally mess up everything. And so it's not even a well-posed problem in that sense. And so at, from the TCS perspective, you're going to need that. If you make assumptions on the input, you don't need that. One assumption could be on the presentation of the input. You could present rows or columns in some random order, and then, and then you know, things could do. But you're going to need something like that. So, so it's sort of a conditional probability. You need to guarantee this. And then on top of that, you're going to need to make sure that something else happens. So optimizing that downstream objective with respect to the probabilities is actually a non-trivial problem. All right. So combined algorithm. Apply some RLA method to, do, to get a sketch, and then do whatever with the sketch. Usually, you solve a subproblem, you give it to a numerical analyst, and they iterate. Here, you um, give it to an SGD person. And then apply an SGD-like iterative phases with, with weighted sampling and uh, preconditioning at each step. Um, so I'll present a more detailed version of that, but that's, that's the algorithm. And to show you sort of the, where the improvement lies here, um, for L1, you get similar things with L2 and constraints and all, but the basic idea is for L1. So in, in algorithms, in worst case algorithms, after t steps, I'm with an epsilon of the solution. Here, the guarantees, here, here the, in, in SGD, the guarantee is this convergence rate thing. So, so that's what this will be, and then I'll, I'll say, show how to tie the two together. But the convergence rate is going to be that um, you know, f is the objective, hat minus f star, the optimal over f is order. Um, some norm of x, the size of the solution, divided by the base error times this thing. The max of some norm of a, this is a certain one norm of a divided by the, by the probabilities. So it's something here. If you use the uniform distribution, this quantity here becomes m, where m is the maximum row norm, times n, the number of data points. You're using this in the setting where you have a million data points or a billion data points. That's potentially problematic because you're going to need to iterate a lot to drive that n down. Similarly, if you use row norm sampling, um, which, is, which is a popular way, you get the norm of A there. So this is a one norm, that could be a two norm, which is a Frobenius norm. So in both of these cases, the convergence rate is something times a quantity which could depend on the high dimension. If you're million or billion by thousand, all of these things could depend on the million or billion, not on the thousand. And you, ideally, you'd like them to depend on the thousand. And randomized linear algebra boils stuff down to the low dimension, but SGD wouldn't. And these don't because I use a naive distribution there. But if I use a smart distribution, if I use a well-conditioned basis, namely the thing that randomized linear algebra gives you, so if I use a well, and, and this is a certain notion of well-conditioned basis for L1, think of it as an orthogonal matrix, which is well-conditioned for L2. It's, it's related to that. Um, this is just the, if, if you know the randomized linear algebra, this is the L-conditioned basis for L1. If I use a well-conditioned basis uh, for the range space of A, and if I choose a sampling probably is proportional to the rows, um, then I get convergence in this rate. Same quantities here with the norm of u, not of a. So the point of the well-conditioned basis, I'll, I'll describe it in the L2 sense, and the same sort of thing goes through to L1. It's the norm of u. So an orthogonal matrix that's rectangular, if this is u, what is the Frobenius norm of u? 
So the Frobenius norm of the U is the sum of one to a million of the Euclidean norms of these rows. You think it's a million or root a million or something. The definition of a well-conditioned basis is that it's not a million. It's, it's a thousand. The Frobenius norm is the sum of these things, and each of these things is unit length and orthogonal. So the Frobenius norm is low dimension. Same thing here. This is low dimension squared or something slightly worse. But it's low dimension. It's not high dimension, which I guess a thousand squared is a million, but if you asymptotic or something. So, um, so that is not A like we saw before that depended on the high dimension. That's the low dimension. That's the point of what randomized linear algebra gives you. And so you get something depending on the low dimension, and so the convergence rates depends on the low dimension. So, um, so this is, I'll, I'll mention a few more details about where this result appears, and I'll show you a couple pictures to show you that it performs well in practice and so on. But the key idea here is that you get a certain convergence rate. And that convergence rate is the usual stuff times a factor that depends on the low dimension, not the high dimension. And the, the way we got the convergence rate to depend on the low dimension and not the high dimension is by doing preconditioning with randomized linear algebra and choosing things in, in smart ways. All right? Alternatively, meaning we have this batch phase, we get good convergence rates. Alternatively, we could have said, geez, just assume some sort of smoothness assumption on the input, which is more common in machine learning, in which case you skip that batch phase because you can do that sort of quickly, not even looking at all the data points in particular, and then you'll get the same convergence rate. Essentially, if you assume that's uniform or if you assume something slightly weaker than that. All right, so main algorithm. This is the algorithm, preconditioned with RLA, use SGD, so there it is. Um, SGD preserves, the algorithm preserves the simplicity of SGD, but also gets the high quality sort of worst case guarantees of RLA, and it says exactly where, you know, you need to put the worst case analysis and look at all the data or make some assumption and get uh, sublinear. Um, convergence rate superior to other sort of related SGD algorithms like the uh, cat's marks. The running time is um, something, say, number of non-zeros plus a poly term over epsilon cubed. If you're familiar with the work in randomized linear algebra, Whenever you see an NNZ, so this is some input sparsity projection that um, Clarkson and Woodruff introduced. You actually need to be pretty rectangular and stuff for that to be relevant. You can, you can re relate that to high dimension times uh, uh, low dimension log, low dimension if you use Hadamard projections. And so all this would go through if you had that. And that typically has better results in terms of the second order term because that poly term is not usually low order. But it's fast in some sense. So you need to touch, look at the whole data so it's not sublinear. And then it's sublinear. Or you can make assumptions the way machine learners do, in which case that thing drops. You don't even need to see the whole data, which is a, a way machine learners typically parameterize SGD type algorithms, and this is going to be something related to that term. Um, where does this perform well? Empirically, it's going to perform best compared to other methods when you're at medium precision. Not extremely low, not extremely high. That's an empirical claim, and we could stress test that some more, but some qualitative property like that's going to be right. If you really want high precision, you've got to iterate a lot. Um, if you want very low precision, the batch phase is tricky, and, and, you know, because that's a fixed footprint of cost. And so, you know, we need to get a little bit better than very low precision in order to pay for that fixed footprint of cost. Wait, so compared to Clarkson and Woodruff, say, so the dependence on epsilon is different? No, th they're the same. This oh, is, this okay. is, so, so um, they don't, they don't, they don't tell you how to solve the subproblem. So the usual thing in randomized linear algebra is get a sketch, solve a subproblem. Don't say how. One way you could solve it is with LAPAC. A different way you could solve it is with SGD. So this tells you how to do that, and so there's some extra, extra factors there. So they just say the, the black box is n-cubed or, or d-cubed, mm -hmm. whatever the small problem is. They, they also yeah. only discuss randomized preconditioning for L2, right? Not for RLP. Um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, random. So this, this business of randomized preconditioning where you, you can then iterate and get a log when it rips on dependence, right? They talk about that for L2. They have... And then they do gradient descent, right? So they, for LP, I don't think... For, I don't for, think for, I don't know if David's here. I mean, if, for, 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 for L1, there was results, and then we had results 1 to infinity. They had strong results 1 to 2, and then there was this arms race. So I don't know what the bottom line is in that. Oh, um, I uh, but I mean, this business of like preconditioning and then, iterate, and then using an iterative algorithm. Yeah, so Jean Rui Meng did that, and I thought David and Ken, people in this, um, Jean Rui did, did some of that with, with L1, and David and Ken. I thought had some results along that line. But Zhang Rui and I, I at least had some, and they, I, they matched, and there was a bit of an arms race for L2, for L1, and either for all P above 1 or for P between 1 and 2. So a lot of the results go through, um, coupled with 
with an iterator. I mean, the, the question is how do you iterate? That's a separate question. And so you need to use some iterative method. And so this dependence is, is not conjugate gradients. That's something else. And so actually for L1, it makes sense to go with something with worse uh, running time quality and better preconditioning quality for the L1 because um, it's particularly sensitive there. It's more so than for L2. All right. Um, so here's the theoretical bounds in, in more detail. Time t is equal to low dimension times various condition number factors. There's two condition numbers. One is on the basis u. One is on the quality of the preconditioning at each step. I glossed over that detail. It's low dimension times those two preconditioning factors times some junk over epsilon squared. So that's the usual epsilon squared you'd see. Those preconditionings, depending on how you turn the knobs, you can make them good um, or not. Or you can assume they're good. Um, similarly for L2, you get the same sort of thing, various factors. So I'm just going to throw these up and, and you can parse them in the papers out. But I'll be around if you can talk to me. But that's the usual, just in terms, if you're familiar with SGD, that's the one over epsilon squared. That's the low dimension, not the high dimension. And the condition number is one or low dimension or whatever. It's not high dimension. Or if you take a bad basis because you work with the original input, it's, it's high dimension. It's whatever it is. So it enters right there. Um, so, yeah. Um, K hat is a different, it's kappa is a, con, kappa is a condition number. There's two different condition numbers. One is a condition number on the basis of the preconditioning stage, and this is a detail I glossed over, that at the, S, at the SGD iterative phase, um, you have to use a, a preconditioner for F, which is a preconditioned basis, and, and the obvious thing is to use the same thing, but you don't have to. So it's, 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 a, it's a condition number at the uh, phase where you iterate. I don't have it here. It's, so there's two different notions of conditioning on the basis. The original basis you get from the batch phase, and then how you'd update the SGD step. Um, all the running times, uh, some of the running times, all of the running times. Connection with randomized Katzmark. So um, randomized Katzmark, so this is a, a type of algorithm that's gone back for a while. Um, not Rudelson, Stromer, Stromer Machine had something about five years ago, maybe a, a little bit longer, um, in this area where they used a randomized version with row length sampling. The row length sampling is not the main thing, but it was, was um, slightly better by a TCS metric, but you get similar results in optimization without that. Um, here, if you use the preconditioner, the inverse of, of the matrix that relates the matrix, input matrix A to the well-conditioned basis U, which is R. You could use other things. Um, if you use that and the leverage scores are computed exactly approximately, what you get is randomized cat's marks applied to the well-conditioned basis. So, um, so that's how that relates to randomized cat's marks. So empirically, I think time's tight, so there's a bunch of curves here. And, um, well, I mean, if, if, you, if, if you want to, we, I can talk about how we have the, this actually runs on a terabyte of data. If someone was talking about MapReduce earlier, I mean, that's a million years old. It's actually a very bad model for doing real matrix computations. We, we, these are actually implemented in Spark. We, we, we have implementations of MapReduce, but this is in, in Spark with the AmpLab stack, if you're familiar with that, which maintains some states, so it, it, you get sort of a bigger win. Um, these, are, these particular empirical results are sufficiently rectangular, that some of that's not important, but if you get a little bit large, like in the L2 case, that does matter. If people are should, I assume most people like big O's and not empiric results, but there's a lot of colors here if, if you want um, to like empiric results. So the point is it's in the intermediate regime where they're, where they're better. Um, and uh, let me leave it at that, I guess. So for L2 regression, um, it has comparable complexity. For L1, it, it has an advantage over traditional randomized linear algebra. Compared with SGD, the hybrid, these the algorithms work in a narrow range, not, not for general convex problems, but for LP regression problems, open problem, open question to say how much more can that be generalized. You have ideas, but let me not go into that here. And the comparison with traditional SGD methods, convergence rates and so on, is very non-trivial. It depends on the specific objectives of interest and in the assumptions made. Are you making assumptions about the input? Are you making assumptions about the curvature structure if you throw in a regularization term, which you could add constraints to this, so you could add a regularization if you wanted. So it really depends on the details of that. So, I'm, I'm missing yeah. What we, so, so SGD converges at some dimension times stuff um, divided by epsilon squared, right? I mean, the, the, the convergence rate of SGD is going to be something like that. You're not going to need anything about the initial condition, nothing? So, so there's a detail I'm glossing over having to do with are you measuring um, quality on the objective or the certificate? But the randomized modular, the, the randomized linear algebra <coughs> says at the end of the batch phase, I'm epsilon good, worst case input. 
So, so, so I, work with a, I work with a good basis, and then I iterate from that. So, so if, you're, if you think of it from an SGD perspective, think of it as guaranteeing a good initial condition. And so um, there's some details in that, whether it's L1 or a slightly regularized version of L1 or L2, but that's, that's the short answer. So the randomized f phase, I mean, remember at the beginning I said, RLA says after T steps, I'm epsilon good. SGD just gives you an, a, a rate. And so here, um, you you're, do the batch phase at the beginning, theorem on epsilon good, use it as an initial point for the iteration. So I, I'm good, I replace this with a D high dimension with a low dimension. I still have that, and that stuff depends on the quality of the conditioning from the batch phase and how I use that preconditioner at each step of the iterative phase, that, which are those two condition numbers. Um, connections with core sets, let me not go through that in detail in the interest of time, except to say, um, there's a lot of work in theory of algorithms on core sets, and, and core sets means different things to different people. Um, one notion that's particularly nice, um, Feldman, Langberg, and Langberg, Schulman, there's, there's a uh, general sort of approach they have with, with core sets there, um, that in, the reason that we like that one is, um, if you take that and, in, so, so that's defined not with respect to linear subspaces and linear regression, but for general problems, general optimization problems. Not the sort of optimization problems that continuous optimization people like, but for, for general sort of combinatorial problems. And it has to do, I, in the slides I glossed over, it has to do with sort of a robustness notion, how, how robust is, is the input, which is what those leverage scores are essentially. Um, if you take that notion, their notion of, uh, of sensitivity, call it sensitivity, which is what they call it, um, and you apply it to LP regression, L1 or L2 or LP regression, um, then they're the same. There's scaling and constant factors, but, but it's the same as either the leverage scores or the leverage scores of the A hat matrix of A augmented by the right-hand side matrix, which is sometimes called influence scores. So, um, so I can go into more detail if anyone's interested, but just let me say that the connection with core sets is, and, that, and this provides one way to generalize these results to nonlinear type regression. Um, the connection with core sets is that this, this um, leveraging that we're using here if you, if you take the more general corset notion restricted, it is that. Um, some of the results that we use to get the, re the particular results we have here don't generalize to that notion, and, and it's open um, whether they could or, or whether that's the right way to do that more generally. So conclusions, general conclusions. Smart, important sampling probabilities and random projections are needed for worst case bounds for a bunch of matrix problems. Um, data are often processed to be nice, and so a lot of machine learning metrics, you know, classification, whatever you do downstream, it's fine if you mess up a few examples. You, know, you want to do well on most of them. Um, and so that's a fairly strong assumption about the data or assumption about the types of objectives you're working with. SGD and RLA are, are very sort of di different approaches to traditional deterministic numerical linear algebra and optimization. Um, and they can be combined here using ideas from sort of stochastic optimization. And so you have a particular way to do that that um, has a bunch of nice uh, knobs to fiddle with and that in a certain parameter regime does uh, better than the two uh, sort of competing uh, things that we're trying to combine. So, um, so you can be linear, um, is the usual thing up to those log O tilde of linear. You can be super linear if you want to do it the old way. You can be sublinear if you want to make assumptions. You can be sublinear after a batch phase if you want to be linear on a batch phase and treat that as an offline off cost. So there's a bunch of things. So you can be linear or sublinear or super linear, whatever you want in linear algebra. So a naive U is the original matrix. For P equals 2, a, a smart U is an orthogonal matrix. For P equals 1, a smart U is a, is, is, is a well-conditioned basis, which is essentially a first cousin of an orthogonal matrix. It's, it's, you're, you replace all the 2s with 1s in the definition, and, and that's an example of a well-conditioned basis for P equals 1. So the idea is that, that um, technically you take the orthogonal matrix and you do a Lana John transformation and you take the square root of that. So that, that's one way to do it. It's not uniquely defined because P equals 1 is not rotationally invariant. So, that, so I don't know of, of, of a general definition. But, but if, if you take a family of things that satisfies some constraints. So the point is that basically the niceness measure is, is of, of, of a nice basis is low dimensional, not high dimensional. 
And the reason the Feldman-Langberg stuff doesn't work for every problem in the world is there are problems for which you cannot get a nice basis. P equals 1 and 2 you can, but there are problems for which you can't. Yeah, so there's a lot of letters for us. So this is preconditioned weighted. Because we preconditioned and we weighted e at each stage of the iteration. So, so who joins that? I didn't catch that. Who joins it? Is this one of the, one of the five? Uh, well, I mean, the particular one, you mean back with this picture? This thing? Yeah, so, so, so I mean, this is, there's a bunch of knobs here. Yeah. The knob can reproduce the cat's marks. Um, you can reproduce vanilla SGD. You can reproduce vanilla RLA with uniform sampling and reproduce vanilla RLA with non-uniform sampling. Or if you set them the right way, you get this middleman that, that sort of threads the needle. No, this is very, very beautiful results. And uh, I just want to share with you in, uh, in machine learning, uh, especially like an ensemble. I want to ensemble different things. Um, the <coughs> necessary condition Pretty much, you want to combine A and B together. And A and B got to be performing relatively very good. That's the first condition. The second condition is that A and B got to be very diverse. And then, <coughs> so that comes to, to me to ask you a question. Is there any way you can quantify the diversity between uh, OLA and SGD? Yeah, so. If you can do that, then, then that's, 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 that's to do that. Yeah, so the last time I was in this room, I think, was about 15 years ago. So hopefully I'm back before then. So if I'm back in one or two years, I might have the answer to that question. So that's something we're actually thinking about. So um, they, they solve different things. So you don't want to trivialize the result by considering general results here. And so, so I don't know how to do it in general. Um, if, if you want very high quality sketch, since epsilon to me be machine precision and eat the one over machine precision squared factor, you know, you're not going to be very diverse because everyone's at machine. So, so set epsilon to be one. Go for very low quality sketches. Um, choose low dimension times two, not low dimension log low dimension. You might lose a bit of a rank. If you lose a bit of rank, you're totally dead with the worst case algorithms. But it's not clear you're dead if, if you're going to try and couple with boosting or ensemble methods. You know, you lose a bit of dimension. That actually adds to diversity. It adds a bit of bias. It decreases variance. So, you, so probably the answer is yes. We don't have a clean statement of it. Yeah. Yeah, with luck I'll know that in a year or two. Yeah, so sure. yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, in the process of combining, try to combine different classifiers together. Yeah. But over there we can define the diversity. Yeah. But, but even there it's, it's not easy to have the A. Yeah, we thought about that a few years ago just with RLA. And the fact that we're doing least squares and linear regression and low rank, and then doing that on the subproblem, it, it wasn't clear that was the best model problem to address these questions with. So now that we have this, I think it, this is a much richer class of models to address that question. And here you're using also scoring and ranking. Um, no, you, you could use this as a ranking function and peop, em, empirically in practice that does well, but, but there was no, in, in what I stated, there was no ranking here. Yeah. My, my experience is that when you have a multiple regression, you have different variables. And the, if, if you can separate those variables and find the diversity yeah. them, then I can show that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and no, I hadn't thought that's not what we were thinking, but yeah, I could, that would be neat. That would be nice. Okay. Yeah, let's yeah, follow up offline. I'd be interested in seeing that. Uh, All right. Well, we got to get you at least a, yeah. Very quick. I just want to ask, um, I, don't, I remember this year there was like a recent at least theory result where I think Cohen and Pang, they showed like for L1 regression, you can get some speed up by using something called Lewis weights as opposed yeah. to multi mission bases. Yeah. Does that fit it? Can that be combined with anything we're doing? Or how do, how do they compare? So, so, I, so I don't know. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, I suspect it's the case that we have one notion of well-conditioned basis that we essentially compute with the batch computation. I suspect what they're doing is getting a different, and by their metric, better. By certain other metrics, I don't know, and empirically, I don't know, but, but a, a, a different basis. So they're, they're using that to construct a different basis for L1, essentially. There's never been any empirical No, comparison. no. Yeah, no one's done it empirically. And so, I, so I think that they would fit very 
quantify you know, these various parameters, the cap and whatever of that basis, and just feed it, so feed it into this machinery. So I think it would enter right there in a very clean way. But we haven't looked at that empirically. I, I don't think they have either, no one else. Does this thing analyze to penalty? Yeah, so it does. Right now, you need to be tall. And you want to do regularization when you're not tall, typically. So we, do, we have some results on the non-tall case, but they're not this clean or general. But if, you're in, if you want constraints or regularization on the tall case, yeah. Um, the, solving the subproblem might be harder, so that you have a different black box, but, but it'll generalize. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, the step size is one of these dirty little secrets that um, most machine learners don't worry about because it's not easy to get papers saying we came up with a new step size. But it, it, step size and fiddling with and tuning with that, in our experience, makes a big difference. And, and, and that's the bottleneck. You can come up with a fancy method and just the, the step size is a real pain point. Empirically, we've, we're much more robust to the step size because we pre-process the problem to be nice. But we don't have a theory to yeah, so describe that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's why I'm saying empirically we're better because we just do the straightforward thing and it's it's fine because we've pre done the batch preconditioning. Yeah. But we don't have the th we've thought about that. But empirically it's better. But we don't know. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot.